Good morning and uh, welcome to the launch of Health Taxes Policy and Practice. My name is Jack Olney. I'm the manager of the Centre for Health Economics and Policy Innovation based at Imperial College Business School, which is hosting this event in collaboration with our colleagues at the Department of Health Systems, Governance and Finance at the World Health Organization. So um, pleased to welcome you here, both in person and online, where we've had up to uh, 500 people registered, so that's fantastic. I'd now like to hand you over to our moderator for the day. This is uh, Dr. Anjana Ahuja, uh, a contributing writer to the Financial Times, a former columnist of the, of the Times, uh, and she also holds a PhD in physics from uh, Imperial College. So Anjana, over to you. Thank you very much, Jack. So as Jack said, I'm, I'm Ange Ahuja, call me Ange, and it's uh, a real pleasure to be back in my old college as your host today. And I'd like to extend a warm welcome, not just to the people in the room, but also the many who are joining us online for the very important launch, the global launch of Health Taxes, which is a groundbreaking book produced jointly by the Center for Health Economics and Policy Innovation at Imperial College and the World Health Organization. So I had an advanced copy, which I was reading on a trip to Brussels this week. And as someone who writes about evidence and policy, particularly in the field of science and global health, I have to say I found it incredibly engaging, provocative, and I have to say that's not something that I've ever thought I would say about a book on fiscal measures. So from a domestic point of view, the launch of this book has come at a fascinating time in the UK, given the release of the National Food Strategy in 2021, and also the recent publication of the UK government's Food Strategy Policy Paper. So today, if you forgive the pun, we will be feasting on this content. And we'll be hearing from the editors themselves, and from the World Health Organization, plus there'll be a keynote speech from Henry Dimbleby, a leading and influential campaigner on food strategy in the UK. We have lightning talks on a handful of chapters, which will give you a flavor of what the book is about. But first, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Ian Wormsley, uh, who is the provost at Imperial College to formally open today's event. Well, welcome to the launch of this major analysis of taxes designed to influence behaviors that improve human health. Uh, as one of two areas in life that are only that are certain, I think we can add a third, uh, which is uncertainty. And so I'm really delighted to see that we're getting used to rapid adaptability uh, in the blended world as events unfold around us. Uh, so welcome both to the in-person audience here and to the many of you online um, through the uh, World uh, Health Organization, Health Systems, Governance and Financing webinar series. So a uh, good morning. The publication of this book is an indication of the importance that Imperial College London places both on research and on impact. We seek both to understand the world and to make it a better place based on that understanding. But ensuring that our work has an impact means building partnerships that can deliver that impact. These partnerships span all sorts of organizations across the academy, across industry, across government, across non-government organizations. And it is through those partnerships that we can begin to design and implement evidence-based solutions to some of the major societal challenges, as well as to support policy development that really guides how we're going to overcome some of these barriers to change. Our policy engagement program, for example, the forum helps link academics and policymakers to share our latest research and expertise. And the Center for Health Economics and Policy Innovation uh, led by Professor uh, Franco Sassi and Dr. Jack Olney, is really our flagship research center on health at Imperial College Business School, and a prime example of how those partnerships are facilitated and really help to deliver the sort of change that we need. A good example of that is the way in which they helped inform the UK's national food strategy and also responded to it when the government released their policy paper. Um, 
the col collaboration now between uh, the Center for Health, uh, Economics and Policy Innovation and the World Health Organization really underlines the positive impact that research in universities can have in offering evidence-based solutions to real-world policy challenges. Um, and, and those partnerships, as I say, are really key from the outset, both co-creating the research and helping to deliver impact from it. It's the prime example and one we're focused on today, but it's certainly not the only one across the college. We're certainly, we're working with policymakers in other areas around data protection, for example, uh, and leading policy debates on changes we need to make around the energy transition, electric vehicles, for instance, as well as thinking about next generation information processing and the impact of uh, some areas of fundamental physics like quantum mechanics on the opportunities in that space. So with this as a good example today of the connection between research and impact, we'll continue to do outstanding research at the college as this book exemplifies, and we'll continue to find partnerships that help us co-create the ideas and solutions based on our research to make the world a better place. So the launch today is a really good example of how that partnership will work uh, and best wishes for a very successful and interesting event. The lineup looks really fantastic and I look forward very much to our, to our keynote speak in this area. area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rudiger Kresh. He's director of the Department of Health Promotion at WHO, and he's taken time out to send us a message. Good morning, esteemed colleagues. I'm delighted to welcome you along with the editors to the launch of the book, Health Taxes, Policy and Practice. Each year, 41 million people die from preventable non-communicable diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases, cancers, chronic respiratory diseases, and diabetes. Most of these deaths occur in low and middle income countries. These deaths could be avoided by eliminating tobacco use and alcohol misuse and by improving unhealthy diets. One of the most cost-effective ways of achieving this is through the intelligent use of health taxes. The aims of health taxes is to reduce the consumption of unhealthy products. Another is to disincentivize unhealthy behaviors that are typically associated with such products. Health taxes achieve both these aims by changing the price faced by consumers so that healthier choices are promoted. Health taxes can also serve as a revenue booster for governments, a fact which is particularly re relevant now as governments are facing the challenges of financing the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, more than ever, health taxes can play a vital role in achieving the twin goals of improving health outcomes and in strengthening the public sector. Despite their demonstrated benefits, health taxes remain underutilized globally. WHO spearheaded a multi-year program of knowledge ex exchange with leading experts in the field of health, tax policy, public financial management, trade law, and public governance. The discussions are now chronicled in this book, Health Taxes, Policy and Practice. The book reflects the first global in-depth discussion on, of health taxes as an independent domain. It addresses the expressed concerns of policymakers and of fiscal sector practitioners in particular, and provides a long needed bridge between global health and fiscal policy concerns. With that, I wish you all a very productive launch and hope that this book will contribute to tangible advances in health, revenue and development globally. I thank you. Thank you very much, Rudiger. So we're now going to hear from the editors who have worked so hard to bring this project together. Each is going to just say a few words of welcome, set the scene, um, and they're going to set the stage for the discussion to come. I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they will speak. So first, we have Professor Franco Sassi. 
Uh, Franco is currently chair in international health policy and economics uh, at Imperial and director of the Centre for Health Economics and Policy Innovation at Imperial College Business School. He's also a former uh, senior health economist uh, at the OECD. And he's done a lot of highly regarded work around childhood obesity, among many other things. After Franco, we're going to hear from Dr. Agnes Suka. Agnes is the director of the Division of Health and Social Protection of the French Development Agency. She was previously the director of the Department of Health Systems, Governance and Financing at the WHO and is an innovator in health financing, such as community-based financing. After Agnes, we're going to hear from Professor Jeremy Lauer. Jeremy joined Strathclyde University in February 2020 as Professor of Management Science, following a career as an economist with the WHO. In 2016, while at uh, WHO, Jeremy initiated and subsequently led a global WHO project on health taxes, health financing and fiscal reform for health. And last but not least, after Jeremy, we'll hear from Anjali Vigo. Anjali, who's with Franco at the front here, is a trained lawyer with a distinguished background in tobacco regulation, who now co-manages the interagency collaboration on health taxes at the World Health Organization. And there are around a dozen international organizations involved in that collaboration, including the World Bank, the OECD, and the Asian Development Bank. So, Franco, if I can invite you to kick off, please. Thank you, Anja. Thank you, Ian, for your very nice remarks. Uh, welcome, everyone in the audience. Uh, and um, uh, let me just say that one word that you're going to hear very often today is timely, because this book is very timely. It has taken years to produce, but it's coming out at a time when it's going to hopefully make a, a big impact. Uh, innovation happens at times of crisis. There's no shortage of crisis at the moment. Uh, and the, if we look back at the last few years, uh, the, the greatest momentum for health taxes was about 10 to 12 years ago in the aftermath of the big economic and financial crisis that hit the world at the time. It was the time when many governments introduced new taxes, new health taxes, particularly on sugar sweetened beverages and other foods, and uh, increased many other health taxes uh, throughout the world. Uh, now, this is going to happen again. We see interest rising again in health taxes, uh, but we are in a much better place today because we have a lot more evidence. Uh, we know a lot more about how these taxes work and uh, how they should be used. Uh, and that is exactly what this book is about. Uh, of course, we are all very concerned about inflation, about the rising cost of living, but that should not be a barrier to thinking about uh, health taxes. Uh, in fact, uh, one third of the revenues that governments are collecting, the tax revenues that governments are collecting from people today is from uh, consumption taxes. And uh, in many instances, those consumption taxes incentivize the wrong type of consumption, consumption that leads to harm to health and, uh, and to the planet. So with health taxes, we have an opportunity to align the objectives of taxation to uh, the things that matter to people, matter to society. And that is exactly what we hope this book will uh, will be doing. Uh, let me just say, if we have uh, the slide with the contents of the book, uh, let, let me just say what the book is going to cover, because we're only going to see a snapshot of it uh, uh, today. That This is one of the several launches that will take place uh, around the world uh, in the next few months. Uh, so the book is covering overall uh, areas like uh, where health taxes fit in fiscal systems, uh, uh, what the effects are of uh, health taxes on uh, consumption, health, uh, on industry, on the economy more widely, and how governments uh, should be designing effective and uh, efficient uh, health taxes. Uh, we're also going to deal with, you know, thorny uh, political economy issues and uh, how governments uh, should be dealing with uh, uh, stakeholder reactions to, uh, to health taxes. Uh, and then we think about what the future of health taxes uh, should be. You can find all of this in uh, in the book and uh, we look forward to discussing it with this with you today. Brilliant, thank you, Franco, for, for setting the scene. Um, can I now invite uh, Dr. Agnes Suka to present her thoughts and, and uh, set the stage for the coming discussion? Thank you very much, and thanks to Imperial College and, and WHO to, to organize this uh, this book launch. 
And I will uh, I will follow on uh, on Franco's point. An incredibly timely book. And um, I think the the first point I I want to make on how important this book is that taxes and fiscal instruments in general are one of the most important, if not the most important, expression of collective action. It is about bringing resources um, in one pool. Um, it is about contributing to the larger purpose. Um, and it is about funding uh, um, public goods. This is the core of the uh, collective uh, projects of the social contract. And in today's world, and in a, in a pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic world, the uh, role of the commons has been highlighted and the lack of investments and the lack of uh, strategic thinking and understanding of the importance of the commons uh, and among those, the fiscal instruments um, has been uh, really highlighted. So as we, as we are all reflecting on the lessons learned of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we really need to think about common, common goods for health and among those, uh, fiscal instruments and taxes and, and, and subsidies. And those are really, um, they should be, and that would be my, my, uh, my second point, they should be the, um, at the heart of the public health framework in the post-COVID world. Uh, health taxes should be part uh, as of the um, of pandemic preparedness uh, investments, they should be considered in the policy dialogue of pandemic preparedness when uh, we know the uh, interaction between NCDs and the uh, health outcomes uh, of um, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to um, look at, the, at how health taxes, taxes can play a role in tackling the challenges, the health challenges of, of today beyond and the products that are taxed today, whether it is tobacco, alcohol, and and um, and uh, and sugar, and think about how can we uh, think about those instruments uh, when it comes to tackling much broader challenges at a time where we have to face the threats of climate change, biodiversity loss, AMR, and so on. And, and I will really finish uh, by saying that this, these, um, these instruments uh, should, should, um, should really be uh, part of, of broader fiscal policies. We, we, they need to be part of, uh, of, uh, of the public health framework. But we know now that markets are increasingly global and that the avenues we've been uh, pursuing so far are mostly country dialogue, but these country dialogues need to be increasingly harmonized. And I really see uh, this book as extremely important in triggering a global conversation on the harmonization of uh, fiscal framework, harmonization of the policy approaches to uh, health taxation, and having a global agenda that is actually thinking a little bit more on how we can learn from the, the effectiveness uh, of these taxes that are well documented in this book and bring it into the global conversation on having global agreements and global harmonization of, of policies. Thank you again for having us today. Thank you very much, Agnes. So now we're going to move on to Professor Jeremy Lauer. Thank you. I'm very pleased to, to be able to speak immediately following Agnes. It reminds me of in 2016 when Agnes Suka asked me to get involved in a stream of work around uh, health taxes in the health systems cluster of WHO, where we then both worked. I was, um, at the time anyway, rather strongly opposed to the idea <laughs> that I should do that. And as most people then, I knew health taxes only as isolated measures targeted mainly at alcohol and tobacco or as a series of mostly failed initiatives to 
tax various components of food, such as salt and fat. Sugar-sweetened beverage taxes were, at that time, one can still say, still only starting to merge into the broader consciousness of global health practitioners. Now, you know, one can be wrong about many things, big or small, but I like to think of Agnes and the years in which we've worked together really as one person who, in my experience, is routinely right about the biggest and most important things. And in 2016, Agnes was 100% right, although I didn't see it, about the critical role that health taxes would come to play in universal health coverage and in the sustainable de development goals more generally. My own view these days is that health taxes are you know, even more just the thin end of a wedge of a thoroughgoing, a needed thoroughgoing redesign of fiscal policy that will be centered around human flourishing rather than one centered merely on the income mediated aspects of human welfare. Indeed, it's hard in the current environment in which the governments of the world have in the last two and so years spent the equivalent of 20 trillion US dollars on the COVID response. It's hard to imagine that universal health coverage will ever be possible without such a redesign of fiscal policy. Health taxes are a fitting spearhead in this development as they are a means of strengthening people's health and at the same time people's communities, by which I mean global public goods, also called common goods for health, to which Anya's referred. Health taxes are also one of the few actions in health that is a one-stop shop, i.e. that represents in one action what normally requires policy plus financing plus procurement plus supply chain plus delivery platform plus a technically effective intervention. Finally, and as a result of that previous point, in fact, health taxes are, in my growing view, really a bridge to a future of global health does, that does not and cannot depend primarily on the health system as currently conceived, namely as limited to biomedical interventions delivered by health workers in health facilities, as important as these are. Health taxes are ultimately about empowering individuals to make more effectively the decisions they say they want to make for themselves. No one would rationally turn down a magic pill that offered them years of additional healthy life. And this is precisely what health taxes and other measures like them that empower individuals with the information that they need when they need it are. The magic bullets of the last century may have been antibiotics, the ones of the coming century are fiscal measures and other forms of human empowerment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, and now I would like to pass over to Anjali Vigo. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you all. My colleague Rudiger highlighted the magnitude of the NCD problem. It's not just a problem that rich countries have to grapple with. It's really a huge uh, global, global issue. And health taxes represent, or was one of the, the most effective ways to address the, the NCD problem. So this book is the first publication which deals with health taxes in a very comprehensive manner. It explains the various aspects of taxes on tobacco, alcohol, and sugar-sweetened beverages, and it touches on other health-related fiscal measures. This book is a good complement to the official recommendations and guidelines on health taxes, such as the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which is the, the Treaty on, on Tobacco Control, as well as the resolutions and decisions of the World Health Assembly. It took a village to assemble this book, and as you will discover, we have assembled a pretty impressive village, village of experts. We have tax experts from the OECD and the World Bank. We have contributions from noted experts from academic institutions such as Imperial and Cambridge. And we also have contributions from members of civil society organizations who have pushed for and advocated health taxes in their, in their home countries. We hope that this will be a useful resource for policymakers and researchers worldwide 
supplying them with the evidence and well thought out policy ideas they need to propose effective solutions. For example, uh, the OECD experts show that health taxes contribute a whopping 0.8% of GDP in the countries which have adopted them. Preeminent health tax economists Lisa Powell and Frank Chalupka discuss in, in, in chapter three of the book how countries like France reduce both cigarette usage and lung cancer deaths by raising tobacco taxes. And uh, Martin White and his team at Cambridge demonstrate that business can rapidly adapt to health taxes without losing out financially. So you're probably aware that here in the UK, sugary drinks become less became less sugary right after the announcement of the levy and even before its actual implementation without hurting the bottom line of, of the affected industries. I will mention the buzzword again. This book is timely. My colleagues have already mentioned the, the revenue issue. Uh, they've also touched upon how health systems are overburdened and underfunded. And I think people have also become more aware how non-communicable diseases increase their risk for developing more severe symptoms of other diseases like COVID-19. So well-designed health taxes can help address all of these concerns and so much more. Thank you very much, and I look forward to, to the discussions. Thank you so much, um, Anjali. So we've had a real setting of the scene there, haven't we? Um, from the magic pill to, you know, the whole overhaul of the fiscal system um, globally. So not at all uh, ambitious, I think. Um, so now we're going to move on to our keynote speaker, Henry Dimbleby. Uh, he has become synonymous with progressive food policy in the UK. He co-founded the Leon restaurant chain and also co-founded the Sustainable Res uh, Restaurant Association. He also co-authored the 2013 school food plan in the UK, which aimed to transform what children eat in schools and how they learn about food. And that led to universal free school meals for younger children in, in British schools. Henry was appointed lead non-executive board member of DEFRA, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in March 2018, and most recently led on the National Food Strategy the first independent review of England's food system for 75 years. It aims to deliver healthy, affordable food to all that respects the environment, is sustainable, resilient to shocks, and contributes to both urban and rural economies. I'm going to invite the editors to come and take a, a, a seat in the front row, and we're going to pass the floor over to you, Henry. Thank you so much. I've spoken a lot since we published the food strategy in July last year, but this is the first time I've been back to an, into an academic context since I graduated uh, in physics and philosophy uh, many, many years ago. And actually, I, I looked into one of my uh, quantum mechanics books last night, still sits on my bookshelf and couldn't understand a word. <laughs> I literally couldn't even remember doing the exam. So uh, I'm more nervous uh, today than I have been, I think, uh, speaking anywhere over the last uh, five, three or four years where I've been doing this. I guess why I'm here is that one of our recommendations was a health tax. It was a, a sugar and salt reformulation tax. Uh, and the intention of that tax was to, as, as the name says, reformulate products rather than increase the price of them. And on the day that we published uh, our report last July, the Prime Minister was collared uh, on, a, on a trip that he was making. And he said he wasn't in favor of additional taxes on hardworking people, which was assumed to be a, a rejection of the whole uh, of the whole plan, but actually, uh, who is in favour of extra taxes on hardworking people? And therefore, I thought what would be useful today is first of all to set in context the work that we did on the food strategy, and then to talk about the particular of the tax that we put in the, the sugar and salt reformulation tax, how we thought about formulating it, and the political. Um, uh, landscape in terms of getting these kind of things in place, because I think that that political landscape uh, exists much more broadly in terms not only of just health taxes, but also taxes on any externalities in any form. And it's important to get not only the policy right, but also the framing right. And I think that would be useful uh, in this context. And I think that this book will play uh, a fantastic role, actually, in both of those things. So what was the national food strategy? The national food strategy was, my job was to say, how could we create a food strategy that not only fed us healthy food uh, affordably at a reasonable price, but also stopped killing us and stopped destroying the environment. 
And I think it's useful to remember where we came from in our food system, because when you talk to people, farmers, people in the in the food industry, they feel at the moment very demonized. They feel responsible for all of the world's ills. And actually, we have to remember that our food system, as well as being a disaster, was a miracle. And in fact, that miracle, can I have the, the slide back, please? Thank you. And the, indeed, that miracle um, created, in many ways, the disaster. So if you look back at the food system, after the Second World War, despite all the bloodshed, we had a serious problem. The population of the world had risen from 1 billion to 1.5 billion over the last 90 years. And if you look at the front pages of the newspapers immediately after the Second World War, there was a genuine fear that we wouldn't have enough food to feed the planet. So this chart here shows uh, three things. It shows the total agricultural land in production at the bottom line. It shows the population of the UK, the middle line, and global food production, the top line. And basically, since the Holocene, since the period of stable climate that started about 10,000 BC and enabled farming, the human response to population increase had been to dig up more land and farm more land. And at 1945, scientists were looking at the fact that population was going to rise hugely and there wasn't really much land to dig up. And what those scientists had failed to factor into their equations was a man called Norman Borlaug, who was a botanist from Idaho. He'd grown up in the Great Depression. Uh, he had seen real poverty on his doorstep. He'd seen food riots. And he set, had set him out on a mission in life to uh, transform the way in which we farm food to enable everyone to eat a decent diet. And during the Second World War, he went to Mexico. He saw the poverty of the soil there. The, the, the poverty of the population. He wrote a letter back to his wife saying, um, the people, the places here have clubbed my mind. I don't know what to do, but we have to do something. And what he did was scuttle from uh, the coastal areas of Mexico to the plains, breeding different kinds of wheat, managed to get two crops a year, which accelerated his ability to make progress. And he developed what is now the predominant form of wheat worldwide, which is short-stemmed with much heavier grains, but short-stemmed so that the wind doesn't, uh, doesn't knock it over and is resistant to wheat rust. And with the combination of that and uh, chemical fertilizer created during, using the Harbour Bosch process and modern methods of irrigation, uh, Mexico were, went from having to import wheat uh, in 1945 to being self-sufficient in 1960. And the same policies were used, the same methods were used for maize and for rice and across the world. And we now produce 1.7 times the amount of food uh, per person on the world than we did back then. We massively increased the population. Uh, actually, we've taken a bit of land out of agriculture and we have produced much more food. This is one of the great miracles. Th a, third, a third to half the people uh, on the planet today, uh, one in three to one in two of the people you know would not be alive today if it hadn't been for this revolution. But this form of agriculture uh, completely dominates our ecosystem now in a way that it is it was hard to imagine then. And actually the scale of it is still almost impossible to imagine. So this side shows the total biomass of animals on the planet, invertebrates and birds, land, uh, land animals, uh, in 10,000 at the beginning of this period of, of stable climate versus the 2.5 million people who lived on the planet at that time. And as you can see, the wild animals completely dwarf uh, the people on the planet uh, today. If you look at the situation today, uh, it's somewhat different. So the people have grown from 2.5 million to 7.8 billion. The wild animals are actually much smaller in weight, in total weight, partly due to our initial enthusiastic hunting of megafauna and then the expansion of agriculture. In fact, the, the animals that we keep as, as pets, horses, cats and dogs, now weigh almost as much as all wild animals together. And the animals on, on the left-hand side that we grow to feed us um, now uh, number... Uh, now weigh twice as much at any one time as all the people on the planet and 10 times as much as all of the wild animals. And what this 
that the impact on the environment of this growth in agriculture is hard to exaggerate. So if you look at the main problems, environmental problems that we face in the world today, uh, if you're worried about biodiversity, food is almost uniquely responsible for the collapse of biodiversity. If you're worried about fresh water shortage, fresh water pollution, you have to look at food. If you're worried about deforestation, look at food. If you're worried about the clearing out of our oceans, look at food. If you're worried about climate change, food alongside energy, food creates, food system creates about 20 to 30 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions. It is food. And so if we are going to restore our environment, we need to look at the food system. But it isn't just the environment that this new form of, uh, of, uh, of, of farming and food production has hurt. It has also hurt our weight. This chart shows uh, the number of people who are obese in the UK today. Well, actually, it shows the, the spread of weight. So uh, on, on the uh, y-axis, you have the proportion of the population. On the x-axis, you have the BMI of the population. If you had looked at this uh, in 1920, you would have seen a very neat bell curve on the left-hand side. And that bell curve has been moving to the right steadily, uh, accelerating in the 80s, until you see some, uh, a situation where uh, this line here is obesity, this is severely obese, over half the population are overweight or obese, but also you see a tail. So there's something in this food system that to some of us is particularly more toxic than to others. So that's the context, that's the system. We then said, well, what do we do about this? How do we even understand this? And people said to us, um, you need to think about this in a systems way. And we then said, well, what, what, what do you mean by a systems way? And one of the things that we were often shown was this chart, which is a kind of, uh, it's, it's known as the foresight obesity chart of, and it, and it shows all of the different factors that make people obese, social factors, marketing factors, family factors, and it looks like a kind of demented spider's web. And it's very clever, and it's very interesting, but it's not very helpful because you look at this, and actually when you're trying to talk to policymakers or even trying to work out what your intervention should be, it is so difficult that it makes you uh, want to give up. Uh, another chart that we were shown uh, is this, which was uh, created by Kelly Parsons, who's in the audience today. And this shows the, the fact that f policy for food is spread all the way across government. So uh, every department has a, a role in creating food policy. And the idea here is, therefore, it's very difficult to get a, a unified strategy because everyone wants their, their piece uh, of the action. And this is true. Uh, and it makes implementation difficult. So if we look in the UK context, on trade, there are massive fights between DEFRA, the Department for Environment, and the Department for Trade about what our trade policy should be in terms of importing goods that are produced to low animal welfare standards, low environmental standards. In terms of uh, ex the taxes that we're talking today, you know, you've got to have broker an agreement between DEFRA, who is largely supportive of industry, between Bayes, the Department for Business, Treasury and health. It's a difficult place to, to, to form policy. But that isn't the cause of the problem. So you have to say there's something else causing the problems. This is something that makes the solving of those problems difficult. And when we looked at what was causing the problems, we thought about uh, systems theory uh, as defined by the science of systems dynamics, which actually started, interestingly, in, in biology, but then was uh, spread by uh, MIT and Jay Forrester's work uh, at MIT, in, again in the, the mid-40s. And here you try to look at what are the feedback loops in these com complex systems that are going wrong? What is it that is causing the system to behave in the way it is? And there are two feedback loops in this particular system that are going very wrong. On the environmental side, and I won't talk much about this, uh, you have what we call the invisibility of nature, and this was pointed out by Partha Dasgupta, the economist, in his absolutely brilliant review of the economics of biodiversity to the tr for the Treasury. And he points out that not only in all of the systems that we use to measure human achievement, human progress, nature doesn't feature, it's not in our wallets, it's not in the balance sheets of companies, it's not in the way we measure GDP, but actually governments subsidize the destruction of nature to the tune of about $500 billion a year. 
uh, to uh, in subsidies to fossil fuel companies and to big agriculture largely. Uh, so we're not actually not even measuring nature. We're giving it a negative cost. We are paying companies to destroy nature. And he estimates that that destruction costs us all about $7 trillion a year, in the, or 5 to $7 trillion a year. In the, the health side, um, we identified what's called a reinforcing feedback loop. So uh, this is what the Sun's view, uh, Sun, for those of you who are not in the UK, is a populist right-wing newspaper here. And their view uh, when advertising restrictions last year on the advertising of junk food were to be put in place uh, was that they were um, ridiculous. And then when they were delayed, they said, that's fantastic. And they said, how about applying the same common sense to other failed measures? like the sugar tax, which won't trim an ounce off anyone's weight, then concentrate on the real solutions, better education on diet and exercise. And this idea that better education and exercise, and therefore willpower, will solve our problems is completely prevalent in the UK, particularly actually amongst those people who suffer in these circumstances. And it is uh, measurably, provably false. So exercise, uh, uh, and the, the w, w labeled water studies have shown this time and again, is a fanta it's fantastic for your health. It is, you know, if you talk about the magic pill, if you could take exercise as a magic pill, it would be the single thing that you could do to improve your health. But it is pretty lousy at making you lose weight. And by telling it because your body reacts and your metabolism reacts and you, you move energy from your reproductive system and your, um, uh, your immune system, to, to replace that energy that you're exercising with. So it's not very good at making you lose weight. Uh, and actually telling people that it is means that they go to the gym, they try to lose weight, and they give up because they fail, and they stop doing probably the single thing they could do above anything else, whether they are uh, fat, thin, to, to, to make them healthy. Uh, and we also know that uh, willpower is not part of, of the situ situation either. Actually, thanks. Uh, in, in a good deal to Kevin Hall's work, another physicist in the States. So what is going wrong? What's going on here in terms of the health system? Well, we uh, describe the problem as uh, the junk food cycle. So if you look at what's going on, it's pretty simple, actually. We have a, an appetite that evolved in a world that was very cal calorie scarce, that uh, makes us seek out foods that are calorie dense, makes them absolutely delicious, particularly foods high in salt and sugar and fat. And also when we eat them, if they are low in fiber, uh, the, the hormones that suppress our appetite are released more slowly with other foods than with other foods. So unsurprisingly, food companies have spotted that these uh, kinds of foods are easier to market, they're easier to promote. They over time have spent more and more money promoting them. We've eaten more, they spent more money promoting them, we've eaten more and we have got sick. And uh, we're not going to break that interaction until we break that relationship, that commercial relationship, which makes it more attractive to do those things. And if you, get a, uh, if you want to get a size of the scale of this problem, this chart here shows on the left-hand side the total amount of money consumers, citizens, spend on fruit and vegetables uh, a year, which is £2.2 billion in the UK, against the total amount of money they spend on confectionery, one tiny category in junk food, which is £3.9 billion a year. And what is interesting is that behind the scenes, the CEOs of the companies, uh, fast moving consumer good companies, um, uh, supermarkets, admit that this is a problem. They are as stuck in the junk food cycle as the consumers are, because if they stop doing this, their competitors will continue and they will get fired. Uh, it's as simple as that. And they will say this to you. They will say, we need state intervention. So what does a good system look like? A good system, we said, uh, has a number of features. If we were eating the right kind of food, we'd be eating fruit and vegetables, 30% more, 50% more fiber, uh, reducing the amount of foods high in sugar, salt, and saturated fats, by 25% and reducing meat production by 30%. That, by the way, is not a, largely a health issue. 
nor is it actually largely a methane issue, the, the methane emissions of ruminants. It's largely a land issue. So 85% of the land in the UK that we use is used uh, either to rear animals or to grow food to feed to animals. And we need that land now to do other things, to sequester carbon, restore biodiversity. So if those are the targets, what do you need to do to get there? And we uh, uh, proposed that there were four strategic imperatives. The first was to escape the junk food cycle. The second was to reduce diet-related inequality. We argued that while uh, the food system couldn't solve the problem of inequality, there were interventions that you could make that I'll come on to to support the diets of the poorest. The third was to make the best use of our land. How do we make sure that we're not just using it all to produce meat and actually have a more varied use of land in the right way? And the fourth was to create a long-term shift in our food culture. And I'd like to finish now by talking about that first one, escaping the junk food cycle and the tax that we proposed as the central feature of escaping the junk food cycle. And I think it would probably be useful to talk about, to break that into talking about how we thought about the design and why we ended up with that tax. Uh, and secondly, to talk about the political issues with actually getting this kind of policy into place. So why did we go for a tax? Now, uh, this is a, a, a chart created by Dolly Tice that shows uh, the 14 different government strategies on obesity, on health and obesity, over the last 20 years. And uh, at the top, you can see these three lines are the obesity rates of men, women, and children. And as you can see, we've been publishing a lot of papers, but not making, making much, much of a dent on the problem. And the reason for this, I think, is because most of those papers, almost all of them, except for the sugary drinks levy, were built around this framing that, um, that, the, that it was all about uh, personal responsibility, education and exercise. And if you were fat, it was your own, it was because you didn't get off your own fat ass and, uh, and get going and it was your fault. And that is not a particularly helpful way of framing the problem when you have this junk food cycle, when you have this feedback loop that is not working. So we looked at lots of different ways of trying to break that feedback loop because a tax isn't the only tool in your toolbox. But we also looked at a tax. And obviously, as, as you will know, and he appears um, quite a lot in the book, uh, although ideas about uh, taxes for externalities had existed, before 1920, they were kind of brought together and, uh, and, and given real form by uh, Arthur Pigou, the English uh, economist, in his 1920 book, The Economics of Welfare. The, the externalities that we were dealing now, dealing with then, were slightly different. This is a picture of the time, of, the, of a town at the time, and smoke was one of the issues. And in fact, the, the first example he gives in his book is the problems that smoke causes. So he says, you know, for this smoke in large towns inflicts a heavy, uncharged loss on the community in injury to buildings and vegetables, expenses for washing clothes and cleaning rooms, expenses for the provision of extra artificial light, light and in many other ways. And he said that if you were to charge the chimney manufacturer for all of those costs, it would effectively change the situation and improve the welfare of the people living in that town. And that idea was kind of uh, prevalent until... 60s and in the 60s, um, uh, Ronald Coase, an American economist, uh, published a book called or a paper called um, "The Problem of Social Cost," and he pointed out actually rightly at the time that there were some problems with Pigou's analysis. First of all, if you were able to define private goods properly and give people rights to those goods, that the system, the market, would actually negotiate its way out of uh, the problems. He also pointed out that in some situations, a pure Pigovian tax, where you literally put the cost uh, of the tax into uh, the cost of the good, wouldn't necessarily be effective. And he pointed out that you had all sorts of other um, methods for encouraging modes of production, grants, subsidies, prohibitions, and, and obligations. And actually, if you look at, for example, the energy transition, if we had at the beginning of the energy transition, put the cost of 
fuel onto the, or, or, or literally put that into the energy system, you would have had social unrest through a system of subsidies. We now have uh, solar power uh, looking like it will be undercutting in the next five to ten years very significantly the cost of fossil fuels. And I would argue that in that particular instance, that was a way of making that transition without creating civil unrest. You know, and if you look at what Macron tried to do in France, that kind of civil unrest is very, very real. Um, but we looked at a, a lot of those other things. And the problem in the food system is it is very hard to define. There are so many different categories of food. There are so many different ways of delivering food. It's actually quite hard to come up with policy in terms of grants, uh, you know, restrictions, uh, obligations that can't be gamed by food companies. And therefore, we worked uh, at length with Rachel Griffiths from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, Joseph James, who's here today, who was a civil servant in the team, who did a lot of the work, to think about how you could use a tax most effectively to intervene, but without causing social unrest. And we settled on uh, a very large tax on the sale of sugar and salt in high volumes. So you wouldn't see it if you, uh, if you went to the supermarket and bought uh, a bag of sugar or a thing of salt. But if you were a food company buying those goods in large quantities, it would cost you an extra six pounds a kilo for salt and three pounds a kilo for sugar. And what we calculated was that actually that would lead to a huge amount of reformulation uh, and calorie reduction, 60 calories, uh, was it? Which I can't remember, I think it's 60 calories a day, which would have been enough uh, to more than take off the overall amount of calories that we're eating. So it sounds like well, not very much, but it is. Um, but without putting up the price of food very much. But there is always the risk that the price of food goes up. And while economists don't like the idea of hypothecation, giving uh, the, the value of some you know, tax to another thing, so sugary drinks levy went to school exercise, economists don't like that. It doesn't make sense. In the case of a tax where you're making, uh, trying to make one end reformulate slightly more expensive, you can. And so we suggested that uh, an amount of that money go to support for diets of those in the poorest in the form of healthy start vouchers, which give poor families and fa for poor families extra fruit, vegetables, milk, uh, free school meals, and support for children during the holidays. So that was, that was the package. Let me end by talking about the politics. Um, so when you look at policy, you have to you have to do two things. First of all, you have to change the narrative. You have to change the way that people think the system works. And um, particular, it, it's interesting, on, on the environment and climate change in particular, there has been huge progress, particularly in the right wing, of understanding that this isn't just a kind of uh, socialist conspiracy uh, intended to destroy the economy. Actually, these are real problems. In health, it is more difficult. We actually have, I'm very glad, Lord Bethel here, who was a health minister for the Tory party during the pandemic. And he saw every day he was having uh, meetings with hospitals and just seeing how many of those ICUs were full of people with pre-existing uh, conditions. And he's now on a mission to try and change the idea, the kind of the, the narrative about what it is to have a healthy nation rather than a free market nation, how the kind of essence of liberty, positive liberty, is health. You know, choice, negative liberty, is nothing if you're not healthy enough to enjoy the benefits that that brings. And in order to kind of change that narrative, you have to do it at many levels. So you have to fight, you know, I, I was talking to economists who had said, well, if we didn't have a national health service, if it was private health insurance, you wouldn't need to bake in the externalities because people would pay for it themselves. And those people sit in think tanks, and you have to take them on. You also have to create a, a kind of better narrative than the nanny state. Um, and, uh, and I think we're getting there. You know, and I think this is particularly, actually, to the more market-driven side of society. But you know, Winston Churchill, for example, said that the best, greatest asset that a nation has uh, is its health. A, a nation has a healthy population. And I think we can see a situation where we're looking in the UK at a, at a population that isn't healthy and how that not only is miserable for 
people involved and their families, but actually as unproductive and uncompetitive, uh, and we need to be healthier. Um, the second, uh, the, the other element, by the way, I think goes the other way. So um, uh, at my wedding, uh, a friend of mine sang one of my favorite songs uh, by the Divine Comedy, Songs of Love, and that has a line in it, um, uh, fate doesn't turn on a wrong and right choice. Your fortune depends on the tone of your voice. And I think that from people pushing these things, the health side, they often come across as cross, angry, not understanding uh, the political situation. And I think to, to, to those of you who engage with politicians, I, I would urge you to, to, to try, if you are one of those people who thinks, this is so bloody obvious, why aren't they doing it? To put yourself in the shoes of the people who are policymakers and try to make it a discussion about positive things, not about negative things. And then finally, on the, uh, on the actual landing of policy, it is always random. So we love the idea that you get these big policy strategies and that the government will take the whole thing and put it into, into place. That is not what is happening, ever. And it hasn't happened ever since we've had democratic politics, you know, right back to Athens. The, the, the job of politicians is to maintain a coalition within their party, within the country. And inevitably, that leads to uh, short-termism, opportunism. So I think we, as non-elected people, our job is to change the mood music, to change the narrative, and to provide ready-made policies that are there that when Marcus Rashford campaigns for them, as he did with some of our policies, they get put into place. Or when George Osborne wants something for uh, his budget, uh, which he did with the sugary drinks levy, uh, suddenly that happens. Interestingly, the budget, you don't have to write it around government. It's one of the few things that you don't have to send around government, which means it's easier to introduce bold policy in a budget than it is in almost any other way. So our job is to create the environment, the spirit, the narrative, and the policies and then when the time is right, the politicians will take them up. It is an incredibly uh, difficult job, uh, but it's a job I think that this book will make a little bit easier. Thank you very much. So thank you, Henry, for that really thought-provoking talk. Um, we, we're going to pick up on many of those themes later on. Um, but before that, we're going to have a series of lightning talks on, on specific aspects of health taxes covered by the book. Um, and I'm going to kick off with um, Celine Colin. Um, a very warm welcome to you, Celine, who's going to give us a taste of chapter two um, and introduce uh, us to the place for health taxes in the wider fiscal system. And Celine is from the OECD. So over to you, Celine. Hello to everyone. I hope you can uh, see the slide. So I'm going to, um, so I'm working at the OECD and we've uh, worked on that chapter with colleagues. Uh, the chapter is really about the place for health taxes in the wider fiscal system. Three messages really that this uh, chapter brings and I would like to discuss with you today. Um, number one is there is scope to enhance the role of health taxes. Number two, um, the COVID crisis creates an opportunity for what we call a health-friendly tax reform at the country level. And finally, what's also extremely key is to make sure that health taxes are well embedded within the design of the broader tax system. So I'm going to go through each of the message briefly. Um, so scope exists to enhance the role of, of health taxes. So the graph on the left-hand side shows that health taxes revenue account for less than 1% of GDP in all income groups. So uh, health taxes reach on average moderate amount of revenue. It represents a 2.5% of total tax revenues in high-income countries at about 4% in middle income countries, which again remains relatively low. But let's not forget that these are averages. So that hides country disparities. And in some countries, amounts are actually significant. Let's also not forget that this is a snapshot and we don't see evolution of the time here. But when we look at data, we actually observe that health taxes revenues measured as a share of GDP have increased in many countries, including developing economies. 
So clearly, health taxes have a significant tax revenue potential that governments should use, in particular when you think that uh, goods that are taxed by health taxes are inelastic in demand, so can be taxed at relatively high rates. At the second graph, so on the, on the right-hand side, uh, here we see health tax, taxes revenues expressed as a percentage of public health expenditures. So uh, don't get me wrong here. It doesn't mean that health taxes revenues all finance uh, healthcare expenditures while just comparing two different indicators. But so what it shows is that in some cases, health taxes account for an important share of health tax expenditures. And therefore, there is potential for those revenues to finance health care systems. Second message is to say that the COVID crisis really creates an opportunity for a health-friendly tax reform. So we know countries are in a difficult position when it comes to public uh, finances during the crisis. All countries were hardly hit, in particular low and middle income countries. And we know that there is a clear need for more domestic resource mobilization to finance uh, the SDGs. Countries are moving to restore their public finance as the, the crisis fades. And many of them have to implement tax policy measures and sometimes even tax reforms broadly. And clearly, the message in this chapter that I want to, to emphasize is that health taxes do have a role to play in those tax reforms. They are an attractive tax instrument to increase revenue in the short run for countries, in particular the one with low administrative capacities or the one with a narrow income tax base because of a large informal economy. And there is clearly a political momentum today that governments should not miss. Let's also not forget that we know from uh, the past two years that smoking and obesity are a risk factor to, uh, for COVID. So there is really a need for policy action on NCDs. So what can country do? Um, several options, obviously. Increase the rates, broaden the base. That means extending health taxes to products that generate negative externalities for health and that are not currently taxed, but also to improve the design of the health tax. In addition, there is also a need to ensure that health taxes are correctly implemented and enforced at the country level. Finally, last message that I want to discuss with you today is really we need to make sure that health taxes are well embedded within the design of the broader tax system. To make my point here, let me just go into a, an example of the interaction between the VAT value-added tax and health taxes, so excise tax. Optimal tax policy calls for a broad VAT base. That means that standard rates should be levied on goods and services, and countries should not use so much VAT reduced rate. And health taxes, so excise duties, are levied in addition to the VAT to really to play a central role in the taxation of health and healthy goods. What we observe in reality is that many countries do use reduced VAT rates for certain unhealthy goods, including food and, and sometimes also beverages. And in those situations, countries should really try to stop using those reduced VAT rates for unhealthy products, but tax them under the standard VAT rate. That being said, uh, politically, it's not always easy to do that. In that case, there is a case to be made to increase even more the role of excise taxes, but this is a second uh, best solution. First best is to use standard VAT rates. <clears throat> Last point, what I want to say is that tax differentiation for unhealthy products can also be implemented through higher VAT rates. That's what we observe sometimes in countries where uh, those goods will be imposed at not the standard VAT rate, but a higher VAT rates. Again, here, we believe that the role of excise duties is the preferred tax policy choice to really tackle an healthy consumption. I'm going to stop here. That was a short overview of chapter two. Uh, the chapter, as you will see, covers many more issues and brings more uh, food for thought. But I just wanted to give you today an overview of what you can expect to find in this chapter. Um, and I'm going to stop here and leave the floor to uh, the second uh, author, uh, Annalisa from the WHO. Thank you very much. Celine, you are right. Uh, we next have Annalisa Belloni, um, who will talk about chapter four, 
supply side responses to health taxes. Over to you, Annalisa. Thank you very much and good morning, everybody. And so with this presentation, we are moving to one of the chapter that is looking at the evidence and the theory around the effects of, of the taxes and is providing uh, the information to policymakers on what are some of the factors that they need to consider when thinking about the implementation and the design of those policies. So health taxes, as most of um, the consumption taxes, are um, applied on uh, manufacturers and therefore for them to have an impact on consumption and ultimately health, uh, they need to be passed on to market prices, which are the, the prices that the consumers face when making their consumption decisions. Our chapter, uh, chapter four, is looking specifically at the first step in this diagram. So what is the impact on market prices uh, of, of health taxes? And we are specifically looking at the licit and poorly economic responses from industries. There are, of course, other type of responses uh, that are addressed elsewhere in the chapter. Chapter 11 is looking at um, international trade. Chapter 12 is looking at uh, political responses from industries. The second step in this diagram is, of course, uh, also equally important, uh, which is how consumers respond to um, changes in price. Prices. And this is addressed in another chapter, which is uh, chapter three in the book. So what is the evidence saying about the impact of health taxes on prices? Uh, we generally say, see that uh, taxes applied on tobacco, alcohol and sugar sweetened beverages um, are passed on to consumer prices. But there is a big degree of variation. And this variation uh, depends on the type of product, the package size or the brand characteristics. We in fact see and, and know that um, industry uh, introduced that strategic behaviors because of course their aim is to maintain the profitability of their business um, even after the implementation of the taxes. And therefore they can introduce um, some uh, strategic behaviors like for example, um, introducing a low price product into the market. Um, we do have an example of this in the UK uh, for tobacco products, for example. Another way they can do so is by differentiating the price of their products. Uh, we do have an example in the US where we see that the burden of beer taxation increases across the income distribution. And what this suggests, uh, it suggests that the price of the products that are consumed by the high income consumers increase more after the implementation of the tax than the prices of the products that are consumed by uh, lower income consumers. And this is, of course, um, due to the fact that there is evidence that um, the lower uh, the income of consumers, the more they are uh, sensitive to price changes. Um, another way uh, manufacturers can differentiate the price of their product is by looking at the level of substitution in the market. We have the example from France in this case, where the tax on sweetened non-alcoholic beverages was fully shifted for products with limited substitutes like soda, while only 62% of the tax was passed through to consumers for products like flavored waters, which is a type of product which is easily substituted. Another type of um, supply side response, which is not a price response, is a marketing strategy. And we have an example of this from Mexico, where after the introduction of the soda tax, um, a number of supermarkets and retailers have introduced price promotion and discounts. Uh, it is important to say that those strategic behaviors illustrated on those, in this slide are more likely to happen when competition in the market is weak. And what I mean by this is that uh, when we have um, examples of monopoly or oligopoly uh, markets, so where a small amount of big corporations account for the larger share of the market, and therefore they have much more freedom in setting their prices. And this is important because we do have examples of this type of markets for the commodities that uh, are, us are usually subject to health taxes. Uh, the last type of response uh, that has, has been already uh, mentioned and is going to be the focus of the next presentation by Martin White is product reformulation. So in this case, the impact on, on health uh, is not due to a 
change in consumption, reduction in consumption due to an increase in price, but to the availability uh, on the market of healthier um, options that are uh, introduced in the market from manufacturers who uh, decide to reformulate the products in order to avoid uh, the taxes. And so with this, I have illustrated the main supply side responses to health taxes and uh, express why it is important for policymakers to know them and take them into account because some of those responses can hinder the effectiveness of the policies while other like free formulation align with it and it is very important for policymakers to consider those responses in particular at the design stage of the tax because the design of the tax itself can influence those responses so this is as well another um, brief overview of the chapter, chapter and is contributed to this book that is providing a lot of, of support and uh, other evidence to policymakers to the design of uh, effective health taxes for health promotion. Thank you very much. So following on beautifully from that, we now have uh, Professor Martin White from Cambridge University and he'll be talking, um, he'll be focusing on the UK soft drinks industry levy as an incentive for beverage reformulation. Over to you, Martin. Thanks very much for inviting me. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about the UK soft drinks industry levy, which appears as a case study within chapter four in the book. Uh, I'm not an economist, I'm a population health scientist, and uh, I've been, was commissioned to evaluate the soft drinks industry levy by the National Institute for Health Research in the UK. And I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors of the chapter here and the wider team. Um, we can see the uh, soft drinks industry levy as uh, uh, an event, an interruption within a complex system. Um, and I won't go into details of this, but one of the things we did early on was to map out the system conceptually and think about the different ways in which it, the intervention might affect that system, the commercial system and the political system around it. Um, and in doing so, we identified the different sectors that might be affected, including government, food industry, consumers, the media and others. Using that, we were then able to identify data sources related to the different pathways through that system. And again, I won't go into the detail of this, but this allowed us to then plan an evaluation uh, that primarily made use of existing data, uh, which made it um, us able to look retrospectively and do long time series analyses. So our evaluation design had six work packages and I'm, I've got five minutes, so I'm only going to talk about a tiny bit of this. Um, essentially, we, as I said, we theorized the intervention we did a number of controlled interrupted time series analysis to evaluate impacts on formulation, volume, prices, purchasing, and so on. I'm just going to present a little bit of that data. Uh, we've modeled health outcomes over short, medium, and long terms. Um, we've, we've now got that data, and we're about to submit papers for publication. It looks very promising. Um, and we've also conducted an economic evaluation. I'll present a little bit of that data from the micro and macroeconomic evaluation. Uh, there's also a whole package of qualitative research which I won't go into. So just to highlight what happened to uh, in, in terms of reformulation. So this chart shows um, uh, over time, so it's a time series analysis from 2015 through to 2019. The announcement was in March 2016 and the SDIR was implemented in April 2018. I think this was mentioned earlier but as you can see um, this is intervention drinks, the red line here and the uh, pink area around it is the, the confidence intervals, the uncertainty intervals. Uh, but what you can see is that from the day of the announcement, uh, there was quite considerable reformulation. So this is the proportion of drinks over the 5 grams per 100 ml uh, threshold uh, for the, the lower levy uh, uh, tax threshold. And you can see that sugar was starting to be taken out of drinks and there was a further uh, dramatic shift uh, in uh, 2018. Um, this is the control categories here and you can see there wasn't a great deviation from uh, our modelled counterfactual here which is the straight line. Um, and if we look at that in terms of sugar in drinks, um, uh, pre-announcement pre is on the left here and post-announcement is on the right. You can see this is the distribution of drinks and the sugar in drinks. So this is sugar in drinks. You can see there's a big category with no sugar in the drinks, there's the diet drinks and so on. And then uh, a peak at around 11 grams per 100 mils of sugar. Um, and those are the, the kind of full sugar drinks like uh, popular Coca-Cola and Pepsi and so on. Um, then after the levy was introduced, 
Um, the levy has two thresholds, one at eight grams per 100 mil and one at five grams per 100 mil. Uh, the tax burden is 24 pence um, per litre at eight, uh, for drinks above eight grams per 100 mil charged on manufacturers and importers and 18 pence per litre of between five and eight. And what you can see is that a lot of the sugar was taken out of drinks and appeared in drinks just below the five gram per 100 mil threshold, uh, which is exactly what you'd expect to happen. Um, so a lot of sugar was taken out of drinks and it was shifted to the lower sugar drinks. So here, sugar is replaced with uh, non-nutritive sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, in combination with some sugar still in the drinks. Uh, but there was also an increase in uh, drinks with no sugar in them. What we found was that there were very different behaviours of different uh, companies. And these were just two reports in the media, uh, for example. So the company Iron Brew, which is a peculiar orange drink um, from Scotland. <laughs> I'm saying that for our international audience because I think people from other countries won't know what Iron Brew is. Um, they decided to take about uh, half the sugar out of their, their drink. Um, there was a big uprising in Scotland and a lot of people stockpiled the original drink. Um, <laughs> but I think that was a, a temporary effect. Um, on the other hand, um, Coca-Cola uh, decided not to take any sugar out of its flagship product. Um, instead, what they did is, is, was to do some price flexings. And what they did was to reduce the volume of each of their offerings. So here's one example here. Their 1.75 litre bottle um, then moved to a 1.5 litre bottle. Uh, after the implementation, and the price changed from 179 to 199. And uh, oh, sorry, I seem to have lost. Actually, there were some figures at the bottom here that I've lost, which showed the price uh, in pence per mil. And what you can work out pretty obviously, the price per mil goes up. So what they're doing is that they're paying for the cost of the levy, the cost to them, the manufacturer, by increasing the price per mil of their products. And uh, we did the maths and worked out, and they actually overcosted that. So in, a, in other words, they, they recouped more than they spent on the levy, um, which is not great behavior in my view, but you know, I'm not an economist. Um, so lastly, then, if we look at uh, industry at reactions quantitatively, we did um, uh, two studies. Um, both, again, used time series analysis. So um, the first study looked at the stock market reaction to the levy announcement. And um, we looked at the uh, stock uh, the share value of uh, the four UK-based companies that are trading on the UK Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange, and we looked at this over a very long period. I'm just showing here that um, seven days around the day of the announcement, because this was the only period in which there was any statistically significant uh, deflection in the share price. And what you can see there was that there was effectively a dip in share price. So on the day of and the day after the announcement of the levy, and then uh, share prices recovered. Um, so it was a very temporary deflection. Um, secondly, we conducted a interrupted time series analysis. So this was using long-term data from 2010 right through to 2019. Um, and this was looking at the uh, UK soft drink manufacturers' domestic turnover, uh, just for consumer price index. So this is again of those four companies. So what you can see is that the, um, and uh, these, these trend lines I'm going to show on here are not actual trend lines. These are just for illustrative purposes on here. But effectively, there was a, a statistically significant impact on both the level, level and the trend um, of turnover in the two-year period between the announcement and implementation. So there was a downward deflection in the uh, domestic turnover, uh, and which then uh, subsequently recovered. And later data shows that growth can, in the sector continued. So it didn't seem to... Uh, adversely affect growth in the sector over a longer period. So that's all I have time for. Um, we have a lot of other data and um, you can find that online. Um, so despite industry claims, and there was a lot of media coverage of the SDIR where industry said that it would cause massive unemployment and decimate the industry and so on, it does not appear to have been bad for industry in the early stages uh, with continued sector growth. Uh, manufacturers have substantially reduced levels of sugar in their drinks uh, with important implications for population health. And as I say, we've modelled those and um, those will be published shortly. But there are very different, it's quite a heterogeneous picture, there are very different market strategies by different companies. Um, uh, but I think overall the conclusion is that the STIL did exactly what it was intended to do, which was to incentivise changes in industry behaviour. Um, and as, as Henry said, that's very much the, the principle, the design of the sugar and salt tax with, that was in the uh, National Food Strategy Plan as well. Um, 
just a couple of points to broaden the public health impact. The SDIL um, could be extended uh, to a wider range of foods as, as proposed. Um, but in addition, um, one thing I wanted to mention was that um, the SDIL is not index linked in any way. So the 18 pence per litre and 24 pence per litre um, tax that was imposed in 2018 has remained the same since. And with the kind of inflation we're seeing now, of course, that tax has devalued over time. Uh, it's not such an important incentive or lever for change in the system now. And I think it's really important that these kinds of taxes should be index linked. That's all I have to say. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Martin. And finally, uh, we have Sarah Mouncey from Imperial College, who will talk about Chapter 5, the labour in, uh, market impact of health taxes. Over to you, Sarah. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you. Thank you for laying the groundwork for me. It's a great way to start. So we've been brought together to do this chapter because although health taxes, as you've seen already today, are quite effective for improving uh, health and reducing consumption of unhealthy products, there are some hesitation from policymakers due to claims often from industry about the negative impacts on labour. So we brought together the evidence around the world to examine the claim, the validity of these claims. So the chapter centres around a conceptual framework and it's a lot less complicated than Martin's and this is available in the book and this framework actually guides you through and underpins the mechanisms of interactions between the health taxes and the labour market characteristics. And it also frames the evidence, which is both from empirical studies and modelled studies for tobacco, alcohol and diet-related taxes in turn for two key outcomes, and that is uh, employment and productivity. And I'll just spend a couple of minutes now to going through each of those. So in for employment, uh, the chapter concludes that taxed industries are likely to see some employment reductions and that we've seen already today by Annalisa depends a lot on various circumstances which we highlight in the chapter but the important thing is to note that it's probably short term in effect because what happens is when consumers stop spending on the taxed goods, they tend to spend on other goods and services and thereby creating increased employment requirements in those sectors. And we call that a sector shift. Taxes will be generated and we've already seen that again today. Uh, so this revenue can be contribute to this sector shift effect, but it can also be recommended to be invested to retrain employment that have been left individuals that have lost out or been displaced from their employment. And an example is tobacco or sugar farmers, and they can be retrained to either grow different kinds of crops or enter into different livelihoods. We highlight that the evidence has been generated largely from industry funded reports. And these reports use methodology that are limited in providing or incorporating this sector shift so therefore they give partial results and in actual fact more robust studies have shown that is either far more moderate reductions or even negligible reductions and in some studies we've seen employment gains and that's an important concept to keep in mind. The next one is productivity impacts. So we start the chapter by assessing the losses and costs associated with consumption of unhealthful products. And we use that, we focus, we use uh, a lens of ill health to consider presenteeism, absenteeism, premature uh, retirement and premature mortality. And we use that as backdrop to then illustrate some of the evidence from around the world on the gains that can be achieved through the use of health taxes. And for that, Australia provides some really compelling evidence for significant productivity improvements as well as cost effectiveness with design targeted health taxes. Uh, that's it, I'm going to wrap up now, but just to the take home messages really is that the use of fiscal policy is an effective WHO Best Buy tool and uh, any claims, any concerns of claims of employment loss and economic downturn tend to be overstated. And I think the main thing is it's crucial for policymakers
considering the implementation or scale up of taxes to really critically assess the evidence funded it and when they're making decisions. That's it, wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so we now have the uh, editors here, our editors online, Jeremy and uh, Agnes, and we're now going to go into a panel discussion about uh, some of the themes we've heard. Um, so the obvious question to ask is, the, the book, as everyone says, is extremely timely, which it is, given we are in the post-pandemic, well, maybe not quite post-pandemic, but we are trying all to recover from the pandemic, which makes it crucial given the role of health actually in COVID outcomes um, across nations, that, that something is done to improve uh, global health. But it also doesn't, doesn't it make the same fact that we are recovering from a pandemic, make it very hard to make health taxes a viable political proposition. So I just want to kick off as, uh, with that as a broad question. Who would like to take that? I can talk to the political side of it. So, so I think that there, there was uh, a moment, I mean, I'm, I'm talking particularly about the context in this country, but there was definitely a moment through the middle and towards the end of the, the most serious part, or the most serious in terms of health terms part of the COVID pandemic, where there was real alignment on the fact that we needed to create a healthier population and that we needed to be bolder than we had been and that we needed to um well, we, i was understood that the state needed to intervene more we'd seen the level of intervention um that, that, that the state was prepared to go to to prevent the to, to to cure so it was understood that it could have been a lot cheaper to prevent uh, i think that that actually it isn't it, it isn't the covid pandemic that has got in the way of that it is the Ukrainian war. So it is the, the Ukrainian war and I guess the inflation, which is partially caused by the COVID pandemic or the response to the COVID pandemic. So it is very, very difficult politically to, even if it is a reformulation tax, to introduce a tax on food or, or increase taxes on cigarettes or alcohol or whatever. And in this country, we also have that combined. So it takes a lot of political capital to do that. It takes confident politicians on the front foot and in this uh, country you also have that combined with party gate and the uh, uh, and the kind of the loss of political capital you know we've gone for government that had in all the polls huge uh, unprecedented midterm leads that it now has a 30 percent swing this morning in a by-election against it and i think that makes it very very difficult to foresee in the near future the combination of those two things, anything kind of significant happening in this country. Having said that, our health secretary in three weeks time is proposing his health disparities white paper. So in this country, uh, people in the poorest 10% of locations live seven years uh, less long than those in the richest. And actually, they are living less long than they did 20 years ago. And it is recognized that that requires intervention. He's doing that and they've got Chris Whitty who led us through the pandemic. So it'll be very, very interesting to see what comes out in that white paper, because I don't think he will be able to get away with uh, the rhetoric of individual responsibility, because it just isn't true, and he knows that. And so if it's not a health tax, what is it? So, do you, so to be clear, do you think health taxes will feature? I would that? be very, I, I don't know, I'd be very surprised. I, I, I think even if you had a, a prime minister at the height of his powers, with a massive lead, just the political difficulty of introducing anything that seems that could be perceived, even it isn't, to add to the cost of living is very, very difficult. So I think actually, even, even if you had to go, you know, but we'll see. So, so going on from that, uh, obviously the, the, the thing that's picked up, the issue that's picked up in the book, and I, I think actually is, is discussed very well and very sort of in a very balanced way, is that often health taxes are regressive. So they do um, impact lower income households more. I just, Franco, could you tell us a little bit about how you, how you bat off or bat away those, um, that point, that criticism? Well, I, I think we have to uh, distinguish different uh, taxes here because uh, not all health taxes are regressive. Uh, and uh, I mean, alcohol taxes are not, for instance. Uh, 
uh, sugar sweetened beverage taxes are yes they are regressive but if you look at the extra burden that they involve uh, for people of low income uh, that we're talking really about a tiny uh, amount of money, uh, you know, a few pounds per year uh, for a low-income household compared to a high-income household. Uh, so that's not really, a, a, you know, a kind of regressive effect that we should be concerned about. I mean, tobacco has uh, bigger regressive effects, uh, but uh, the, the benefits, the health benefits that tobacco taxes bring to people translate into economic benefits because, as Sarah has shown, uh, uh, the productivity uh, gains uh, that we can get from uh, the use of health taxes are so large, particularly for tobacco taxes, uh, that in the end people are going to gain more than they lose uh, you know, by paying more taxes. So I want to bring in um, Jeremy and Agnes here um, as, as well, because obviously this is you, you discussing the, the book, and everyone here I think is, is clear that health taxes are a positive uh, move in terms of human flourishing, as Jeremy sort of very poetically put it. How do you move forward with a book like this, implementing it, turning it into something that is used across the world? Who would like to come in on this? I think it's um, it is a change of paradigm, and uh, until uh, I mean, health taxes have been around for a long time, as we know. If we look at tobacco and, and alcohol, this has been a very long journey. So we, we've learned a lot. And, and what this book says, it really works. And it can really fundamentally change um, the way we look at some entrenched public health problems. And uh, the discussion today and, and the talk we just heard places this issue at the center in the sense that it's not just one more instrument on one more tax. It's really, as I mentioned earlier, it's a change in the way we see taxation as uh, shaping markets and behavior. So yes, it is regressive if it is seen in isolation, but if it is seen as an overall different way of conducting fiscal policies and in which there is a full attention to the issue of uh, of affordability and price and, and regressivity, and that it may actually be that more nutritious food, more desirable uh, market behaviors be promoted. So it's, it's really about that behavioral change and, and shaping of markets, which we haven't uh, fully grasped. And this is why the whole health taxation uh, conversation needs to move together with the investing in the commons discussion about how to tackle the formidable challenges that are ahead of us in terms of our food system, in terms of the environmental impacts on health that are coming our way. And um, and the, the, the conversation needs to be at the heart of of the public health conversation. It should not be just uh, a small agenda. We together uh, in, in the WHO, we published this guidance note on investing in commons for health as a, uh, it was just published just before the, the COVID pandemic, but it was as if we had predicted it. It's really those, those five core public good functions and taxation and subsidies is one of them. And uh, really that thinking that taxation is not only about raising revenue, but that it is an incredibly powerful instrument to shape markets in behaviors need to be much more centered uh, in, in, the, in the public health conversation and in the societal post-COVID conversation. And I, I, I think that's, that's a, of course a challenge, not that things are easy, but that there's really this question about which is very similar to the taxation of fossil fuels, right? So the environmental question and the health question is needs to be uh, joined. And I think it would be a mistake to keep the health tech taxes discussion within the uh, sub discussion of NCDs, because mm -hmm. health taxation is also uh, a tool that can be used for communicable disease if we mm -hmm. think about the question of of, uh, of husbandry and uh, and whether this is poultry or, or beef production and that's really that thing this book sets the scene for that for a broader conversation 
And having this discussion about taxes recently, I was in many meetings on One Health. And uh, surprisingly, this topic was never touched upon. And I was really uh, uh, happy to have the opportunity to say as part of the One Health conversation, we need to have a whole line that looks at the question of fiscal instruments because Thank these you. are uh, really incredibly powerful. Thanks. Jeremy, did you want to come in here because you, you, with your background, you can give us a kind of broad idea of, of how things really need to change fundamentally in order to accommodate health taxes? Well, 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 thanks. And, you know, I really want to, I really want to echo and, and um, amplify, you know, what, what Agnes has been saying. But I'd like to take a particular, I'd like, like to look at that through the lens of a particular example. Uh, you know, for, for, for a long time, we've been talking about how there's no money to do things. We have to cut uh, services. We have to cut public expenditure, everything. You know, there was one moment really of global optimism around 2002 when, you know, nation states around the world got together and said, we have the money, we have the will, and we have the way. And they created the global fund and they put over 20 years, about $50 billion into it, which is tiny. It's nothing at all. Now, we've just gone through two years and more of a COVID epidemic. And in those two years, those same governments have put $20 trillion and counting of public expenditure into what is essentially a health issue. I mean, a lot of this money is fiscal stimulus and support for furlough and so on and so forth. Now, one may say, you know, we have inflation, that's bad, but really what's the counterfactual? A global economic winter that, you know, the only other thing that could have created such a catastrophe would be nuclear war. So, you know, we, there is something called the public sector as much as certain representatives of government would like us to believe that there's only the individual. There is collective action, as Agnes has been saying. There's the possibility for coherent and strong collective action around a program of policy to which everyone assents. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, Angela, can I bring you in? Because you work with all the agencies and these, you know, these multilateral organisations that have great influence, the OECD, the, you know, the World Bank and so on. What is the appetite, do you think, and what, what, is, what is their take on how fiscal redesign has to happen? Are, are, they, are they at one with that philosophy, with the philosophy here? Yes, yeah, so uh, I, I think there is a, a positive reaction, a positive a, a opinion among the, the development agencies that we, that, we, that we work with. They do think, for instance, our, our counterparts at the World Bank think there's really a place for health taxes, for, for rebuilding, maybe not, not in the post-pandemic yet, but you know, within, within the context of, of, um, of uh, COVID-19. COVID and I just want to go back to your earlier question about political appetite um, f from the countries. Uh, is, it, is it reasonable to propose health taxes at this time? Uh, in a recent convert, we've had recent conversations with with, with um, legislators. So these are these are uh, decision makers who haven't been as steeped in health taxes as we as we have probably, and they are. You'd be surprised that they are interested. I think, you know, health taxes are underutilized globally, so they haven't raised health taxes in a while. A recent WHO report found that only 13% of the world's population or in, in around like 40 countries or so are covered by uh, tobacco tax rates, which follow the, the, the WHO recommendation. So that's, that's a very small, uh, small population. So there is scope to raise them. Granted, I think maybe they're, they're interested in the revenue uh, impact of health taxes, but when they hear about the health, health impact, and they haven't heard these points maybe as, as often as we have, it, it, it's refreshing to them. It's, it's, ah, really? Like it's, 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 um, it's, uh, it, it hooks the bit. So there is, there is appetite, I think. And the, the challenge for us advocates is to, you know, as, as Henry mentioned, uh, changing, change the narrative. One book is certainly not going to change the narrative, but I think the, the, the challenge for us health taxes advocates is to take what's in the book and reframe them 
and make them uh, relatable and digestible to, to decision makers. So, yeah. Thanks. Uh, and Henry, I, mean, I want to bring you in because one of the things I think is quite striking is the public narrative on health taxes. And in the book, I should say, it's not just about sugar, salt, um, processed uh, foods, etc. Um, and alcohol. It's also, you know, you talk, you widen the scope quite considerably. So, for example, taxing the consumption of fossil fuels, which would not only kind of improve health, but also, um, I suppose, indirectly as well, but directly have an impact on, on the climate issue. Um, where is the public voice? And Henry, you may be good here because you, you do a lot of the outreach. So, where, because we talk, we've heard a lot from multilateral agencies, we've heard from uh, policy makers or we hear from politicians, what, what does the ordinary person think about health taxes generally and extending them? So I can talk about UK citizens. As part of the work we did, we travelled around the UK, um, to all parts of the UK, kind of informally, visiting everything from farms to food banks. We also conducted a series of citizens' dialogues again in all different parts of the country where we brought together a group in each one of a hundred citizens demographically selected to represent their areas and we brought them together three times so there was kind of education piece discussion piece and then decision piece and the answer is it depends on what the issue is so for example on the sugar and salt reformulation tax uh, people of all demographics are so fed up with the level of marketing of junk to their children, to them, they're fed up with the food environment. And we had, a, we had actually, uh, as well as this, when we got the policies, we had one of uh, the leading kind of pollsters discussion uh, who, who work sometimes for the Conservative Party here, run the, run the policies past. We thought, and he thought, that the sugar and salt tax was definitely electorally doable. If you look then, you know, you talked about uh, fossil fuels. If you look at meat and the, the, the carbon impact of meat, not just from the methane, but actually more from the land that it takes up. When we talked about a meat tax in a UK context, um, you could feel the crackle of energy in the room and that there is something, it was really visceral. There's obviously clearly something deeply culturally embedded in the UK culture about meat and uh, not, you know, not wanting the government to get involved. And we said actually on meat, we think that if you put a tax on meat, not only would it be deeply regressive because it would be, if you did it per mm. gram of carbon, it would be much more expensive on mince than it would be on a fillet steak. But we thought it was politically undoable. So with meat, we said, actually, what you need to do is um, change government procurement, invest in methane reduction technologies, and invest in alternative proteins. And we think you can get the meat transition to happen without actually having to do the tax that we thought any government who did a meat tax would be out on their ear within, a, within, 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 month, within months. Would be mints. Would be mints, yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, could you, for example, um, have a, a tax on red meat, but not healthy? Well, it's interesting. Meat. So when you get that, the reason that we chose sugar and salt as a per kilo for the tax is whenever you get into definitions, it becomes very, very complicated. And yeah. there are all sorts of ways to game it. So th that is why, for example, you know, even taxed on HFSS food, uh, rather than the salt and sugar, it's just a nightmare. So you say, you know, is, is it on cheese? Is it, no, well, it's in certain categories. It's only on processed food. Is this process, you know, very quickly, it becomes horrifically complicated. So the one thing I would say with these taxes is the simpler the, uh, the object of the tax, the better. If you think you can get around it with, you know, we, we had a wonderful man, Tim Lernig, who's now our Chancellor's Chief Economic Advisor and uh, a professor at LSE. And we would roll, we kind of game play with Joe and various others. Okay, if we were, you know, trying to get around this, how would we do it? Almost every single version that isn't a pure tax on something very simple, you can work out how you get around it in about five minutes. Brilliant. And, and, I, and because it's, uh, before we move on to our Q&A section, um, can I, as a, a sort of moderator's prerogative and as a journalist, ask a really stupid question, which is, if these things are so bad for us, why can't you ban them? 
I mean, is that just too extreme? Because well, we are, in some sense, we are saying that you shouldn't be eating this. You know, we are, um, we, we, you shouldn't be doing this. Actually, why? I think it's very interesting what New Zealand have done, where they're actually um, changing the rules around the purchase of tobacco so that uh, as children grow up and become adults, they will no longer legally, even at the age of 18, be able to, to buy, buy cigarettes. Um, I mean, is that... What, what are the obvious arguments against that? I think tobacco is pretty unique in that it is the only product sold to us that will kill us if we continue to do it. You know, are you going to ban ice cream? Are you going to ban sweets? Are you going to, you know, like... If, if, I, I, if I can. Yes, Jeremy. I mean, I think, you know, the, the question that you ask is really, you know, what is the appropriate policy response for, you know, this, this range of activity that seems to be, you know, health harming, right? And, you know, when I, when I was saying that health taxes are empowering of individuals, what I mean is really focusing on the information content that they contain. There's a double hit to the health taxes. It hits you in the wallet, yes, but it also hits you in your cognitive understanding of the impact of that product on your health. And ultimately, ultimately, a centralized measure such as taxation, that is, you know, a push or a nudge or whatever we want to call it. Is, is not as powerful as something that, you know, maybe comes uh, integrally from the context at the decentralized level where individuals are actually forming their own opinions and, and bringing the knowledge that they have and the resources and the skills. But as a bridging measure, they're not bad. I think, you know, the regulatory approach of banning things is just short circuiting, circuiting that whole cognitive pathway that ultimately people are stewards of their own health. And we want them to be better, more enabled, more empowered stewards of their health. Thank you, Jeremy. I think that's a really good point at which we can move to the Q&A. So um, I would like to invite both people in the room, people online. We have Jack, who's going to be funneling questions online to us. Um, Please, if you have questions for our esteemed panel, lovely. So we'll take this gentleman here and then we'll take this lady here. So we'll take your questions first, your two, and then we'll put them to panel. Uh, I'm James Bethel. I was Minister for Health during the pandemic. Uh, and can I just start, since I'm first up, to say thank you very much for this. It's a really powerful piece of work. Uh, I, I agree with Jeremy that we, we do need to be positive. We need to have a sense of collective action and we need to believe in policy and that policy does work. And there's a lot of scepticism, uh, not least in the Treasury, uh, but also amongst the public, that interventions work at all. They do work and this is a, a good piece for doing that. Um, if I can just ask two questions about it. Firstly, the phrase health tax for me, although it's, you know, it's, it has the advantage of doing what it says on the tip, actually fills me with horror because when I was a health minister, I was very conscious that the Department for Health was being scapegoated for the country's health, whereas most of it, two thirds of it, had nothing to do with us. It had to do with clean air, and people's activity, and their mental health, which often had nothing to do with us. We could probably account for that a third of it. So having health taxes is, does not account for all of the um, other parts of people's lives. It also doesn't, it also implies that the costs of um, bad living, bad decisions, are felt only in the health budget. Whereas actually it is the productivity of the country and the costs to welfare and pension, which are where the really big sums of money are involved. And so I'd just like to suggest and ask the panel, is there a way of linking this much more directly to a broader agenda about trying to make the workforce of, say, this country much more productive, longer lasting in the workplace, not more years of healthy, happy, hard work, and fewer years of being poorly in hospital, in rehabilitation, and being paid social care. Because that politically, and that's really what my contribution is, that's the argument that I can win. I can't win an argument that says, if you stick a tax on burgers, we're going to shave some money off the healthcare budget. I can win an argument that says that we're going to be a highly productive company. So sorry, I, I'm just conscious that we don't have much time, and and that I, so is your essentially 
you're saying that that you would like health taxes to be renamed? Much beyond that. I think there's a scope. And is, do you have a specific question for a specific member? No, we I can move no on I'm, I'm, I'm giving my that's, questions. Okay, so that's a comment. Okay. I've got another one. Brief, please. Um, secondly, innovation. Um, I think you are right that um, this is a lot about trying to change behaviours in the business. We need to champion the fact that there are good alternatives. We need to champion unleaded fuel. I remember when unleaded fuel came in, it's cheaper than leaded fuel. A lot of people were sceptical about putting it in their cars and buying an unleaded car. We need to make sure that people understand that there are alternatives to the fillet steak and to the burger that are delicious, that the fizzy drink that had the urn brew drink that had the taken out was as good, and that the San Pellegrino drinks that have all the sugar in don't sell very much at all. If we don't champion innovation, then we're just taking donuts away from poor people. I, mean, I would love to that first question about the framing. I would love to hear Jeremy or Agnes's view on that, because for me, fundamentally, how who which is big, frames this whole debate is really critical. So I, yeah. I saw Jeremy nodding along to what was being said. I'd love to hear what he feels about that framing element of it. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll try to be really brief here. I, you know, I fully agree. Um, you know. Sadly, we failed if, if we didn't get there with health taxes. Uh, and, you know, we didn't invent the term, you know, we picked it up in, in a discourse that was happening. And we, you know, said, this is good. Uh, and we heard from a number of people who were saying environmental taxation, health taxation, these, these are concepts that people can make a bridge between. So the term is, you know, it's expressive, it's specific, but absolutely correct that what we really want to be linking to is the whole agenda of human flourishing. You know, all of these lives, you know, stunted and short, short foreshortened needlessly or capacities for longer, more satisfying, uh, healthy lives, you know, with families and friends and satisfying careers, not just uh, higher wages. How can we, you know, really make a bridge to all of that? Uh, you know, I think that when we think about fundamental constituents of welfare, health, education, uh, you know, physical integrity, agency, you know, are, are among the chief ones. So I think we're not far off, but if we haven't bridged enough to these other domains, then, um, uh, you know, we, we have to think about that, how to do that in the communication, because it's, it's essential to do it over. On that point, I can imagine how kind of headlines would work with health taxes, and they're not going to be kind, I suspect. And sorry, we we didn't get your question. Did you want to ask a question, Miss Please, please. And yeah. so please do say who you are, where you're from. I will. Thank you, and keep it brief. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kelly Parsons. I am a researcher at the University of Cambridge. So my question is: Given that health taxes represent a coming together of fiscal policy, health policy, potentially departments, political interests responsible for the feed industry. You talked about sort of brokering between different parties. What have we learned to date? Um, and I'm thinking particularly for, about Henry's work on the uh, salt and sugar tax, but also the soft in drinks industry levy about developing, incentivizing, embedding those sorts of links between those different policy areas and interests. So I, I'm not sure whether our online um, audience heard, but the, the question is, is given that uh, health taxes really cross a lot of departments, how do you get that embedded? How do you get that sort of interlinking to happen in a functional way that delivers what you want? So who would like to take that? Well, uh, Maybe a double act, Franco <laughs> and Henry. <laughs> no, first. First. No. So um, it's even harder than I thought it was at the beginning. And um, I think there are two things that will, three things that will mm -hmm. happen. One is, you have to get a narrative that, or, as we were just discussing, that all departments can get behind. There has to be something in it for them. Um, the second is it actually depends enormously on specific personalities and personal friendships. So when these things go round to write round, they have this per where they send it round the different departments, and they have a kind of passive aggressive thing where they change the text, and then the other department will change it back, and then they'll change it back, and they'll change it back. And then if they can't agree, it goes to number 10, and number 10 decides, our prime minister decides. And actually, when you get things through, it's because those ministers are texting each other and they've got a good relationship. And that is almost by accident. And therefore, the third thing I think you need, which actually the, the thing that I was 
uh, saddest that the that the response to my work didn't have on Monday was you need to have on statutory footing. So if you look at what we did on climate change in this country, by embedding a uh, a statutory a legal target and then creating a a body in the Committee for Climate Change that reports back, marks the government's homework on that department. You make sure that even if you have a moment where you don't have that chemistry going on, there's always something there to bring it back to this government, future governments, and keep the momentum going. Okay. And just want to say that uh, government politics, uh, you know, between different government departments is very complicated. Uh, but there are clearly natural allies of uh, health ministries, uh, namely the, the environment uh, department is usually a very, you know, strong and close ally of uh, health ministries. Of course, there are also government departments that are very opposed to the idea of. Uh, having health taxes, uh, but the real gatekeeper is treasury, of course. Uh, uh -huh. uh, you know, the, the, the gatekeeper that decides when taxes are introduced or not uh, is treasury. Uh -huh. What we argue in the book, in the final chapter in particular, is that health ministers uh, have a very important uh, advocacy role uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, advocating for health taxes. Uh, but they shouldn't be uh, accepting any tax as a health tax, uh, because uh, uh, for a tax uh, to be called a uh, health tax, uh, it needs to be, uh, you know, to have very specific characteristics and uh, needs to be in a position to improve health as well as, uh, you know, human well-being. Uh, so I think that they should really be very strict on, uh, you know, what taxes can be named as uh, health taxes. Lovely. Thank you. Jack, do you have um, some online questions? Would you like to see a couple? Yes, of course. Okay, great. So I've got a question here from Norman Maldonado. Um, might you speak into your mic? Online. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, so he's asking, what is the book's perspective on taxing already reformulated products? So those are, those are products that have already been reformulated and then taxing? Correct. So sort of calorie-free beverages, zero sugar coke. I think I think you should take that one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, the, uh, Calorie free drinks are, are a very complex area. I mean, there are several people from the WHO here, and WHO, we, we have been waiting for years for the WHO to say a word about uh, whether you know we should be switching from sugar sweetened beverages to our calorie free mm. beverages. Uh, hopefully, that guidance is coming soon, and uh, we'll know what to do with that. Uh, uh, the kind of reformulation that uh, Annalise and, uh, and Martin in particular have been talking about uh, is uh, a reformulation that is taking place to some extent. Uh, we, ideally, we would want more, uh, and uh, Henry you know, has, uh, has proposed a framework for incentivizing more. Uh, clearly, to the extent that uh, you know, reformulation is incomplete, uh, products will continue to be liable to taxes, uh, health taxes. Uh, but the idea is that taxes will continue to incentivize reformulation, including for the products that have already been reformulated to some extent. And we do see in analysis like the ones that uh, Martin has been doing, uh, that reformulation takes place uh, in multiple steps. Uh, it's not just a one-off. Uh, uh, it does reformulate gradually. I don't know if Martin has any. Jacks, we have another online question. OK, uh, so this question we have from uh, Abdiraham uh, Ibrahim. Uh, who's asking, uh, he's saying that excise taxes were meant for alleviating the health harms caused by certain products and their application on reducing the problems should be essential. His question is, what can be the consequences when governments divert taxes, those taxes to use in other forms? So do you mean, does the questioner mean that sort of if you're diverting the revenue? Correct, yes. From health taxes into non-health spending. That's exactly right. Perhaps, Angela, would, would you like to take this one? I mean, is, is, that, is that common, actually, with health taxes now? I don't know where the revenue goes. Um, I assume that they, they go to full health spending. So the, the question of uh, earmarking or hypothecation, it's, it's an issue that often comes up in, in health taxes discussion. So we thought it would be good to have a discussion on this in, in the book, and you'll see um, the chapter prepared by our health financing specialist, Susan Sparks, and tax expert from the World Bank, Chad Ozark, in, in the book, we discuss these issues. So uh, I think uh, there are several countries which earmark health taxes for health purposes. So in, in the, I think, a 2017 report, of the 80 countries that were surveyed, around 54 earmarked for, for health. but. Um, it, it's not, you know, it, it, WHO doesn't 
make a sort of a, a, a clear recommendation on this. So countries are free to 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 use health tax revenue in any way which is appropriate to them. So it's a little bit difficult to answer what would happen if it's diverted for a a, a purpose that's not not specified. So so I. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I turn over to Jeremy. Well, if 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 I may, if I may, um, maybe here, I think that very clearly the book doesn't define health taxes as the revenue going to health. It defines health taxes as fiscal instruments that influence behavior behaviors and markets so that it leads to better health and healthier behaviors. In fact, I would uh, suggest that we don't use the word diverted. It doesn't matter. In fact, what is important is that the taxes shapes uh, the market, but the, the revenue, sometimes it is useful to earmark it, mostly actually for political economy reasons, that it's actually a very good argument to make. Uh, people are more likely to accept the taxes if they actually go for health, but uh, in France, for example, some of the taxes go to, uh, to pension schemes. And uh, it was also part of the political economy uh, when it goes to the pension schemes of, um, of farmers. But the, in terms of revenue, we know that revenue are fungible and that uh, the potential additional revenue that these taxes would bring can be, um, even if they are earmarked, um, usually what happens in the midterm to long term, they can be a rebalancing with, with less general revenue going to, um, to specifically the health sector. So generally, I think the book goes um, on, on the side of earmarking is really not uh, the central question. And um, it may have short term benefits, but in the long run, it's not terribly important. So just Anne, yes, absolutely right. So the, the, the economic theory is that hypothecation is meaningless, effectively, except where you're trying to, so in the, our case, where you're trying to make the bad stuff more expensive and the good stuff cheaper, where you, it is, the economists will tell you you're allowed to do that. But I think that, the, as you said, it is hard to underestimate how much citizens don't understand that particular point of view. And it, for example, with our sugary drinks levy, it all went to exercise in schools. So politically, it's dynamite hypothecation and link it to other things. So I think, as you said, it's uh, it's it's a political thing, but it's, it shouldn't be written off just because economically it's nonsense. That's great. Um, we had one uh, question at the back, which the lady on the end, and that's and then and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. Who are you? And thank you very much. From? Yes, my name is Elisa Pineda. I'm a researcher here at Chepi. I'm a public health researcher and also a food researcher. So I'm very interested in learning the political perspective um, that was mentioned by Henry and also Lord Beto. So what would be the required type of research and how to make sure that that research is really efficient to translate into the argument that was being discussed to really make those um, health taxes being effective, but also not just focusing on the health taxes, but also improving the food environment that allows consumers to have healthier dietary patterns. So I'm interested in learning a bit more about what can I do as a researcher um, to improve that um, argument. That's a Thank great you. question. So I'm going to I'm going to go to you, Henry, to, to finish up, because really, what's the killer piece of research that you need to present to someone like Lord Bethel that can persuade him and his colleagues to market these and get them? Yeah. So, so it's interesting. Well, I think the question was like, if framing is so important, what research can you do to show that framing works? Is that right? And I think that you know there are. I mean, I'd be very interested in 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 James's answer to this. There are there are some in there's the Framework Institute. There are some people doing some work on this, <laughs> but behind the scenes, political parties spend a lot of time with their internal advisors listening on on framing. So we try to use citizens' dialogue, citizens' assemblies. So, but genuinely try to understand the citizens. You you said earlier on. Uh, about the, the, the concerns over how, how do we bat off that concern and that is exactly what politicians are expecting people in this room to do not think seriously about what the voter thinks but try and bat off the, uh, people and I think actually if you could do bits of research that really convince them that they can not only make the country a better place 
but do so in a way that makes them electable by doing that framing research, whatever form that takes, that would be incredibly valuable. I think that's a that's, great point. Uh, I, I think that's a great point on which to end so that we, we can go off and have some food and drink of our own. But, uh, <laughs> so sadly, all good things must come to an end and today is no exception. I hope you've enjoyed it. I would like to thank everybody who's contributed our editors, our panellists, our audience in the room, our audience online, thank you very much. Um, I want to congratulate the authors on a really important book. I, uh, I really do feel like this is a moment in, uh, in kind of fiscal landscape. Um, where, and we are all beginning to think about how we're going to recover from the pandemic. Um, I wanted to say, as well as the thank you to, to, to the people down here and in the room, I want to thank uh, Jack Olney, and Lorraine Sheehy, who have done an incredible amount of work to put this together. Um, I want to encourage you to carry on thinking about these important issues, uh, whatever you're going to do now, wherever you are in the world. Um, and for those here at Imperial, I hope you'll carry on the conversation in the foyer with coffee. So please join me in thanking everyone involved.